Welcome to Skull Stories, presented by Cambria, proud to be the official countertop of the Minnesota Vikings. Tonight, we're speaking with former Vikings head coach and one of the best offensive line coaches I've ever seen, Mike Tice. Well, Jay, it wasn't smooth, but it was a win. The Vikings walk off the Detroit Lions 19-17 on a 54-yard field goal from Greg Joseph, and the Vikings improved to 2-3. and three. So... Some of the bright spots. Joseph went four or five on field goals and one on one on extra points, hitting 32 from 38, 55, 54. It's, it's great for the young man to be able to have that feeling. It's the confidence, building that confidence for the future. And you know, when you get into these situations, he's already been in a couple of them so far this season. Even in this game, hitting two from 50 plus, that is a huge bonus for this team. So it was great to see Greg get one when it counts and to see that offense be able to move the ball as quickly as they did within, you know, 37 seconds just to, to seal that victory. That was great to then have Greg come out and actually pop it through. It's kicking, man. It's just one of those things. So, uh, Cousins had another solid game and was clutch, especially on that final drive that put us in field goal range, 25 of 34, 275 yards, one TD, one interception, two sacks. Some of the throws that Cousins makes that very few, quarterbacks in the league can it's just the anticipation being in the pocket uh, a couple of those out routes especially to, to Jefferson were just things of beauty thrown on the sideline They're, and I and I chuckle because they're they're impossible to defend there were multiple times in that game where I just said he's on fire right now and that's an unbelievable throw so it's been yeah. awesome to watch hey we're two and oh with Alexander Madison as a starter 25 carries 113 yards a touchdown Great effort by the offensive line. Uh, Justin Jefferson, 104 receiving yards at halftime and ends the game with 124. I remember thinking at halftime, this is going to be a breakout game for, for Justin. We'd be kind of waiting for it. It was something that was talked about going into it was, you know, he's doing well, but what is he going to have that, that, that breakout game? And I really thought he was on track for it. I loved that part of the game early. I mean, you have that kind of talent outside just. Go ahead and trust it. In the defense, you know, a little leaky in the ground game. It's going to be a, a ground and pound, I think, uh, type day for Darnold. He can throw the play action, and they just don't do much of it. So I, it's just the way things are kind of setting up. You just think that this is going to be a, a game where Carolina is going to really challenge you on the ground, but we'll get more into that later in the show. But tonight, our special guest of the evening is someone well-known by Vikings fans, part of this franchise for 13 different seasons, including a standout at tight end. Our former offensive line coach eventually working his way to the head coaching spot in 2001. In fact, at the time, he was only the second position coach in the history of the NFL to make the jump from position coach uh, to head coach without having without being a coordinator. One of the biggest personalities, always has a great stories to tell. Let's get into it with former Vikings head coach Mike Tice. Well, it's my pleasure to bring in Mike Tice to the conversation. And Mike, uh, you were here over the weekend for the alumni weekend. Kevin Williams going into the ring of honor. Um, talk about Kevin Williams for just a minute and what he meant to this team. Well, of course, we were lucky to get uh, Kevin in the draft, which would have been the seventh pick, but <laughs> then the eighth pick with the ninth pick. <laughs> calm down, calm down. Exactly. <laughs> so we... We were really uh, blessed to get Kevin. He uh, was definitely uh, an elite player for the Vikings for a long, long time. You know, we played him uh, his rookie year 12 games outside and then moved him in inside for the last four games. And he had five sacks in the month of December and was a rookie of the month in the NFC. And we knew we had something or the Vikings had something special. From then on, and then he came back a second and had 11 and a half sacks, 70 tackles, 52 solo tackles. I mean, the guy just, the, the guy just tore it up and he went on to have a great career. Very humble. One of the most humble players that I've been blessed to be around. Uh, great teammate, uh, great, quiet leader, if you will. And, and what I loved about Kevin when I was around him, he was very appreciative. You know, he was appreciative for the moment. He was appreciative for the chance to be in the National Football League. So I really uh, admire Kevin a great, great deal. And you've coached a lot of different different characters, different personalities, and we had some that were high maintenance and required a lot of attention, and, and Kevin just showed up and did his job, did he not? 
He did. You never had to worry about if you got that late night call that it was something about <laughs> Kevin Williams. I could promise you. So you could check check him off the list of worrying about. But we did have a few guys, like you said, that when that phone rang at my house after eleven o'clock, it was never good. But it was not. It was not about Kevin Williams. That's for sure. It might my might, might have been about one of us numb nut coaches too. So Mike, I, you know, that's one thing I, I do. For you know, for the folks that are listening, you gave me my opportunity to coach, and I will be forever grateful for that. It was the best of times and worst of times. I sit here and look at this building, you know, in awe and wonder with what we, you know, with what we were working with and what we did, and you know, it, it's it's really amazing how far this franchise has come and where the Wolves have really taken this place. Oh, they've done a wonderful job, man. You you remember we used to pump a portable air conditioner into the <laughs> locker room yep. at Winter Park because the air conditioning unit broke down and they didn't want to pay to put a new one in. Yeah, no, they've done a great job, and I was very appreciative when Mark Wolf reached out to Diane and I invited us in for the ceremony. And uh, the stadium, we stayed at the Omni Hotel, the hotel, the facilities, the practice field, the practice stadium, uh, orthopedic hospital, just everything that they've done has been first class and uh, we just got to win more games put yourself in an offensive line coach's shoes because you were the, one of the best i've ever seen at that position what advice would you give to daris if you want if and when he gets his first start it's going to be faster than what he's used to so he's just gotta you know maintain his technique when things might not be going well he might be getting a little bit edgy Go revert back to your technique because technique is always going to win. I've heard you say it before. As a defense, as an offensive tackle, you're blocking the defensive end about ninety percent of the time. So it's not as if there's a, right. a ton of game plan that you have to remember, right? Yeah, you don't need a doctor to, <laughs> to play tackle. I mean, it's like uh, I think he's going to have a good start, an excellent start, hopefully. And uh, again, you know, when the things start flying around and the bullets start flying, and things are going a lot faster than your you know, ever seen in your life because the athletes are better uh, revert back to technique because that's what's going to help you you know you are what your record says um they've lost some close games uh it, you know put yourself in mike zimmer's shoes and and what what do you say to a team like this at this moment in this period of this of this season well you know if you believe in your program you gotta stay the course and you can't all of a sudden start doing things that are not within the personality of your program and you know, it's easy to uh, all of a sudden start listening to the naysayers, and they say you should be doing this, and you should be doing that, and you should be doing that. But they don't know. They're, they're not in the building. They're not watching practice. They haven't watched the tape. So you got to stay the course. you got to stay on task in what you're doing. you got to figure out, okay, what are we doing well? Let's do that better. What are we doing poorly? Let's improve that. And what are we doing poorly? Where let's get rid of that. It's just it's just not working. Yeah. When 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 we were here, we had you know an unbelievable receiver in Moss, and we had Culpepper. What we do have now is Dalvin Cook. What do you think of Dalvin Cook as a running back? I think he's an exceptional talent when he's on the field. Uh, you know, he's been he's been dinged, and so now he's you know nursing that ankle. I didn't think he was the same explosive player the other day. It was obvious that he was not 100%. And so when he's healthy, elite. But when he's not healthy, uh, it's it's hard. When the Vikings, you look up and they got 60 yards of rushing somewhere in the second half, and they're built to run the ball, play action, move the pocket, get the quarterback outside the pocket. When that thing turns into a drop-back passing game over the last three years since I've retired and have followed the Vikings closely, when you get into that drop back passing game, it just hasn't worked. They, they haven't been able to hold up. Just to set the record straight, how many years did you play in the NFL? I played 14 years in the NFL, and I, I coached 21. Now, when those 14 seasons of playing, how many games did you miss throughout that throughout that 14 year stretch? Uh, I think I missed uh, three games with a broken sacrum, a broken bone <laughs> in my back. <laughs> and I think I missed three games with a fractured left ankle. I asked these questions kind of tongue in cheek. Is it not? But, fra- I, didn't carry the, but I didn't carry the ball thirty five times. Mm, that, that, well, that's true. <laughs> but my point is, isn't it frustrating overall? And I'm not just talking about Dalvin Cook, but overall in this day and age of football, to see these guys that are constantly questionable and getting vet days, and I don't know. I mean, I, I scratch my head sometimes, but the game has definitely changed. 
Well, you know, there's a lot to, to do with that. And some of it is the personality, the traits of these younger kids, the way they're raised as far as, uh, as far as, uh, with the agents and the agents in their ear telling them, if that hurts you, don't play, don't play, don't play. So there is some agent stuff involved in those decisions. I also think that the players have uh, changed. There's so much money involved. They're looking at the long term, I believe, and, and how much money they would lose if they have a significant injury. And, and, and a lot of players don't want to play hurt. It's just a different mentality than it used to be, Pete. I mean, yeah. I was a grunt backup tight end, man. <laughs> they all had fingers hanging off and, you know, broken hands and you name it, you know, torn pec muscles. Hey, I was snapping it up with a leather harness. As you know, you're going with right. a puppy. Leather harness on my shoulder, and I was going the hell out there. I had no choice. I was a grunt, man. I wasn't, you know, first-round goal pick. I wasn't elite. I was just a guy. Skull Stories is presented all season long by Cambria, the official countertop of the Minnesota Vikings. We'll be back in a moment with more Skull Stories right after this. It's football season at Mystic Lake with Vikings Drawings. Enter casino and digital drawings for prizes like season tickets, away game trips, and an ice castle fish house. Get details and enter now at mysticlake.com slash vikings. Now let's get back into our conversation with former Vikings head coach Mike Tice. I know you're um, out in Canton, Ohio, working at a at a camp. Um, let the listeners know exactly what that is all about. This is the second year of the NFL Academy. Uh, I volunteer with Dean Dalton, the old running back coach for him, his company, Wave Sports and Communication. They have a partnership with the NFL alumni and the Hall of Fame. Uh, of course, the Hall of Fame is a is a publicly state traded stock now, and so they've developed the program to be the feeder pool for the 32 NFL teams when they run out of players and need to uh, add players to their roster, most notably the practice squad. And so we get the last players cut. We we can only bring in so many players. So we bring in eight offensive linemen. Uh, we have six defensive linemen. We're supposed to have we're supposed to have six running backs, but we literally, because of the injuries in the league, Pete, lost four running backs opening week wow. because they went to teams. But that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, they went to four teams uh, before they even got here. You know, we don't want the players here long term. We want that. We want to find out why they got cut. Let's make those things better if we can. They're in the classroom. They're also on the field. They also work with the great Chip Smith in the weight room and doing football movements and other types of plyometric things. They have a mental program here, believe it or not, where they, uh, you know, hook up electrodes and, and find out why the kid can't sleep and why he's got wow. anxiety about doing this. This program is phenomenal. But wow. what it's designed to do, we only have three positions, O-line, D-line, and running backs. We want to do all uh, 22 positions. The program's growing. It was hard last year during COVID. But the program's designed to be the feeder pool for the 32 NFL teams Instead of, for example, I'm talking to Steve Jordan and Cam Jordan, of course, is his son, and and Steve wanted him to say hi to a DB that went to school with one of his friend, one of Steve's friends. Well, Cam said, "Dad, we brought in 20 DBs. I don't know what kid that is." So wow. these teams are spending all kinds of money to bring players in, free agent players in, on Mondays and Tuesdays to <laughs> fill that void where they have had the injuries that week. The whole idea for this is to have this feeder program where they can go ahead and say, hey, Dean, what do you got as far as offensive line? Hey, we grade these players every Thursday. We sent, we put together cut-ups and tape of what they're doing. I've tried to design the program where all the movements that they're doing and all the drills and things that they're doing are movements that a scout or a general manager want to see to evaluate this particular player. And now that we're, the, we're the feeder pool. And so I'm having fun. I'm here uh, uh, the first two weeks. I go home to Seattle for three weeks. I come back for a week. I go home. I come back. And so it's a lot of fun. It's rewarding. I volunteer. That's fantastic. The other Mike. thing, though, that the other thing that's more important for Diane and I is we formed a foundation two years ago that raises money for youth programs, and we're really excited that we came to Minnesota last week and we wrote a check for seventy five hundred dollars to wow. Operation Warm, the Twin Cities Fire Departments. Last year we wrote a check 
We gave out 2,200 winter coats last year to underprivileged kids, and we're going to be able to give out more coats this year, and we're really excited about that. Wow. We've also written, we've also written checks for, in the last month, over two hundred seventy thousand dollars to boys and girls clubs, and so we're pretty excited about. Well, that. My, so Mike, if, if for a listener right now, how do they find out more about and how can they go and donate? They can go and donate on the website now. We don't have any upcoming events, but we do have a website that gives you the ability to donate. You can pick the charity of your choice. All the charities are listed. We give to multiple charities from New York to Minnesota to Nevada to Seattle, Washington. And that's the Mike Tice Foundation dot com. Pretty pretty simple. The right. Mike Tice Foundation dot com. They can hit the donate button and go and use your PayPal. And uh, and we're pretty excited about it. We've raised a lot of money. We've been able to raise over four hundred thousand dollars wow. this year in our events. We've we've had three events, and uh, now it's on the football. And then we'll start back up at the end of the year working on next year. That's awesome. No wonder why your foundation covers, you know, coast to coast. You've got you've got family still everywhere. I mean <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we do a we do a donation. It's not a big one. We give five thousand dollars to my high school uh, uh uh Hall of Fame Foundation because they give out scholarships in the name of my mom and dad every year. Uh, we do of course the Minneapolis Fire Department because of my connections in Minneapolis still and we want to take care of those kids. Everything is involved with youth. We really clung on to the Boys and Girls Clubs a couple of years ago. We donate to three Boys and Girls Clubs, and each one of those three Boys and Girls Clubs have seven branches underneath them. Wow. So that's really 21 Boys and Girls Clubs that we're donating. That's, that's so amazing. We're, we're, yeah, it is amazing. We're pretty excited. We've given out over $1.5 million over the last 10 years, so we're wow. pretty, pretty excited. That's awesome, Mike. So, well, please say hi to Diane for me. Say hi to John for me. I think he's out in Ohio with you as well. Is he not? No, John's down in Florida. You know, he's a grandpa. And oh. He's like in the family life. I got your roommate here, though. I got Sid Pelletti. You got here. Sidney, my man, <laughs> Sidney down there. You got a... <laughs> He spent he spent all spring with Ted Cottrell down in Texas with the football team. I mean, Sydney yeah. Sydney's uh, he's everywhere, man. It's awesome. Yeah, I got Sid Vicious here. We'll give it a shot. <laughs> Sid, <laughs> Sid Vicious, Vicious. that's awesome. Well, Mike, right, thank bro. you so much for your time. I appreciate it, and and I'm just uh, you know I'm so just to hear what with everything that you and Diane are doing for charity is just absolutely amazing. And good luck well, with your with I, your academy. I know it'll succeed if you have your hands involved. It's going to be run the right way, and it will be successful. Well, we appreciate it, Pete, and it's good to hear your voice, buddy. All right, man, you take care. Thanks again to Mike for taking some time out of his busy schedule to join us tonight. And It's always great to catch up with him, considering all the things he's doing to get back to the community and making a difference all over this country. All right, let's take a look at Northern Tool and Equipment. Keys to success versus the Panthers as we head down to Charlotte this Sunday. Northern Tool and Equipment brings the power with top brands like Milwaukee, Steel, Lincoln Electric, Honda, and more. Northern Tool and Equipment, quality tools for serious work. Now, this Carolina team has relied on the run really as a focal point as much as any team in recent memory, but why wouldn't you when you have a top five player in the league when he's healthy and Christian McCaffrey, he's an amazing talent. Um, they use him well. He has a hamstring issue, hasn't been playing. I look at Carolina and say, you know, of their first six games, four of them are at home. And it's a situation where I think Carolina needs to come out. They want to come out of this opening stretch with a winning record because they're going to be on the road quite a bit coming up. So if McCaffrey can go, I, I, I expect him to be on the field this Sunday. He is a guy who, when he is out there, you have to have a spy on him. Yeah. It, and, and even if you do, you still might not catch him. Right. And you, you need someone with the athleticism of Barr and Kendricks. I mean, we have, I think, a couple of linebackers that can keep up with him. And don't forget about Chuba Hubbard either. I mean, he, he had 134 yards last week, runs the zone as well as anybody I've seen, has a really good stiff arm. Um, the Carolina's offensive line is, is a little bit of a work in progress. Um, Brady Christensen got his first start at right tackle for him. They've been moving guys around. Flipping guys from one side to the other. So they're, they're, they're struggling up front. And if they can get it done on the ground, I, I think they'll take it. Um, and that is also all going to help Darnold because Darnold, he, he's a very, very talented guy, 
but like you were you and I were talking about earlier I think his time with the with in New York really has affected him because he is not comfortable in the pocket uh, both their tackles don't protect their space very well and with the way Everson Griffin and Daniel Hunter are rushing the quarterback right now I just don't think they have the confidence to just drop back pass in this game 35 times you have to get in his head early as as early as possible because if you do he makes a ton of mistakes um you know it sounds similar to what we talked about a couple weeks ago with baker mayfield like if you can get him here in footsteps even though he is a mobile quarterback he gets a little skittish and he can definitely make mistakes and turn that ball over for you you know the first three games that they won uh almost 900 yards passing three passing tds three rushing tds one interception Sacked only six times. The last two losses, 478 yards passing, three touchdowns, two rushing TDs, five interceptions, and eight sacks. So if you collapse the pocket on him, hit him early, get after him early, and then just keep that pocket in his lap, and I think you'll get the results that you want. But um, a talented receiving core, I mean, DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson, Brandon Zilstro, they've all had solid seasons before. Uh, DJ Moore leads them in targets, touchdowns, yardage, and yards after catch. The Vikings will have to figure out a way to stop him. But, again, I, I just don't see this passing game with the with the pass rush that we can put on being consistent. We had the, we had the Lions by a two-score lead. We had them one-dimensional. That's when we started getting after Goff, you know, making him uncomfortable. We have to do the same thing again. And in the last two weeks where they have struggled the most was some of the replacement players coming in on that offensive line. If we can get some extra pressure right up the gut there, right between the guards and centers, I think that's really going to do some damage with Sam. And defensively, you know, they, they were leading or at the top of the league in statistics. Dallas and Philly both had success on the ground the last couple of weeks. Our offensive line will need to be on their A game. Hopefully Dalvin Cook will be healthy. And we can get back to, you know, the run, the run game, run threat first and then passing off of that. So once again, this game Sunday is a noon kickoff down in Charlotte. Be sure to join Paul Allen, Ben Lieber, Mike Mussman, Greg Coleman, and myself on the KFAN pregame show and broadcast all across the Vikings radio network. It'd be nice to just have a bit of a snoozer <laughs> to go on there and, and just have that feeling, not as if, man, God, we're just letting this team hang around, but saying, yeah, we're we're in control of this one. Go down there, make a statement, be definitive, and, and come out with a good feeling with getting a W down in Carolina. Absolutely. Nothing better than winning on the road, I'll tell you that. Well, thank you again for joining us for another episode of Skull Stories presented by Cambria. Proud to be the official countertop of the Minnesota Vikings. We'll see you all again next week.